In the fall of 2016, we heard the results from the Keynote 24 trial, which was a randomized study looking at the immune therapy drug PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab versus standard platinum doublet chemotherapy. The, the trial screened nearly 2,000 patients to find the 300 patients that went on. And in the screening, what they were looking for was really to see was there tissue to do the testing and how many patients had enough PDL1 expression in their tumor. The level of expression that was required to go on the trial turned out to be 50%. So it's a pretty high bar, but when you look at all comers who were looked at for the trial, it's about 30% of patients who end up having that level of pdl one expression when you look at newly diagnosed lung cancer patients. They did exclude those who had EGFR and ALK, so that was a small number that were taken out for being excluded. Also excluded patients who had untreated brain metastases. So that's not a huge number, but it's something we need to keep in mind when we're looking at how to bring those data into treating our patients in general. But it was a really exciting trial result. So in that group of patients who did en enroll in the study, the group who received pembrolizumab had a response rate of 45%, which is high, higher than what we usually see with chemotherapy. The chemo response rate was close to 30%, so around what we would expect. When you look at the time to progression or progression-free survival, that was also in favor of the pembrolizumab. And that hazard ratio was 0.5, so it was quite significant. Then when you look at overall survival, there was also a statistically significant survival benefit with the pembrolizumab. And that's despite the fact that the patients who received chemotherapy were eligible to switch over to pembrolizumab at the time of progression. So it became a, a study showing that starting off first line with the pembrolizumab actually improved outcome survival even compared to starting with chemo and then switching to pembrolizumab later. But we have to keep in mind it was a subset of patients that had that high expression. They had to have at least 50% pd one expression by the particular assay, which is that 22C3 test. Contraindications to immune therapy are rare, but they exist. When patients come in to see me now, almost all of them have heard about immune therapy, and most of them want immune therapy, and many of them don't want chemo. So we have, I, I joke that I spend a lot of my time convincing people when they do need chemotherapy and convincing them when they don't need immune therapy, but never the other way around. The challenges with immune therapy is that what it's doing is it's Triggering the, immune, triggering the immune system to recognize the tumor in, in a way that's more significant than what it was doing on its own. But when you're tricking the immune system into being more reactive against a tumor, you can also trick it into being more reactive against normal tissue. So that's really the challenge is developing autoimmune disease. And the autoimmune diseases that we see can impact almost anything. So people can have colitis or the terrible rash, endocrine disorders, but also cognitive dysfunction. It can get in and cause CNS problems, cardiac dysfunction. So it's a whole host of things, and some of them can be fatal. So it's not a, um, it's not a class of drugs without side effects. And of course, patients who have underlying autoimmune diseases are at highest risk for those problems developing. And so that's really the major contraindication. People are starting to push the boundaries now. When the trials were first developed, patients with any autoimmune disease were excluded. And now that we're seeing the efficacy of these drugs, people are pushing into, well, what about if it's just type 1 diabetes? They've already, they don't have function of the pancreas anymore. And so now we say, okay, that's probably okay. What about if it's just a, a cutaneous issue and it's cosmetic? Well, maybe that's gonna be okay. But what if it's terrible rheumatoid arthritis that's crippling? Well, maybe not. What if it's a terrible uh, GI autoimmune disease? Maybe not, and yet we get pushed in that direction. And so we're still trying to work out what are the boundaries for exclusion for people who have autoimmune diseases. Other than those autoimmune diseases, there really aren't a lot of contraindications. There are some that are relative. There was concerns about brain metastases early on, but now it seems that actually the drugs are pretty safe even in that setting.